What's up? This is James Dare. He's one of my mates. Um, he's got a mental health company and I'll let him explain what's it about and why he started it and how it came across. I guess I, um, I wonder how far back to go really. I mean, it started a long time ago. When I, when I was, I got, I'll go all the way back for school. When I was at school, um, I never really felt like I belonged anywhere. Mm. You know, I always felt like I, you know, I never really fitted into any particular group or, you know, I sort of changed through a lot of friends. And then I, I found in, in secondary school, I found a group of friends that I sort of clicked with. It was a small group of people. And when we was, like I smoked, I smoked weed when I was quite, like, too young <laughs> and <laughs> I did that up until about um, 17 and all the other guys in the group started using harder drugs like MDMA cocaine ketamine LSD yeah, you know, yeah. just the party standard party drugs and um, I'd never had any interest in doing that I was actually quite scared of doing them I just felt like I'd probably die if I did drugs <laughs> when I was a kid yeah and you know belonging like the most important thing to any, anyone, as a, especially as a kid, you know, you'll do anything to uh, Fet in. fit in, feel yeah. loved, feel appreciated. Um, so I went, I, you know, I, I started trying these drugs and started using them. And um, I actually um, realized that through using, I didn't, I real, this is a later realization that I had, but through using these drugs, it actually solved a lot of my anxiety problems. It solved like my social anxiety. I could socialize with people. I yeah. found a group of people that I feel also never fitted in anywhere, all came in to fit in this place. People from all creeds, colors, backgrounds, you know, you had, you had your nerds, you had your jock type <laughs> people, you had just everybody from every background all coming together with sort of like a common interest. And it really sort of, uh, broke down everything but made everybody different you know it just sort of stripped everybody back to their bare bones and yeah true you know that was really that was really cool that we got to all have something in common um whereas in school we would have all been different in different groups you know you would have had differences and it, been, it removed that separation that was nice to see um an experience experience things like um like uh, telling your boy mate that you love him and just like you know put your arm around uh you know your boy mate be like, i love you mate you know things <laughs> like as a, as a man like at school you'd never say anything like that cause no, you're gay. no. <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean and just break down these stupid little things um and you know that was for a short period of time that was all great because it seemed like it had solved some problems and uh, to be honest I was oblivious to that at the time I was just ignorant and I was just going with it six or so years went on and then I sort of looked back and I thought and I wonder had to wonder when the last day that I didn't use drugs was oh shit you know I'd, like I and it led me on to going from using them to selling a little bit to my mates and I was like oh that makes it free cool <laughs> yeah you know and now I get free stuff and then and then all of a sudden you you feel like shit on a Monday morning you're like oh well, I've got a little bit of these drugs on me I was like oh just have a little bit and yeah you know you do a little bit of that and and you feel all right again you're like oh nice yeah I don't yeah. feel like I want to die that's great yeah. you know and then slowly but surely you're doing that all day every single day and you have to sell more and more and just to Com like just to compensate and to feed your habit yeah um and it just really spiraled out of control into an absolute disaster and i guess when it, I, I mean i felt like at the age of 21 i actually felt like i was never gonna see 30 i actually turned 30 a few days ago i didn't think i'd make it to 30 i either thought at 30 years old i would either be dead or i would have had serious bodily harm to my internal organs or something and I would, would be body like, shutting per down. permanently disabled in some way or another. Yeah. Because I was addicted to, got get addicted to ketamine, which is a really unusual thing to get addicted to. It's uh, yeah. used as an anaesthetic. 
and it <laughs> g- gave me a fair bit of up and go it did it was a uh, bizarre how it agreed with me and so many other people in a way <laughs> I say agreed but it felt it seemed to resonate and uh, seemed like it felt like it did some good for me but in reality it was actually killing me <laughs> yeah you well know, it's tr- it was so destructive and I guess the big the biggest wake up call for, for me was when one of my best friends uh, took their own life in uh, 2013 when I was 23 Shit. and that you know that that really gave things a wobble at that point I'd already had two friends take their life and that was just like you know that comp- that just should give everything so the foundations of my world such a rattle and that actually encouraged me to leave leave the circle I just had to leave the country I went you know to the opposite side of the world from England all the way to Australia yeah not with the intention of traveling traveling but the intention of surviving so I left and landed in Australia and I just tried to drink myself to death and it took me a month of drinking every day to realize that it was never going to do what I, what what well, they never going to give me the desired effect. Yeah, it yeah. Made, it made me feel awful. Did any of your mates leave the country as well? Like get away from it all? I actually, some friends before me left, and that sort of gave me the um, excuse me, that gave me the inspiration to actually leave. Yeah, the wee little the boost, the kick. Yeah, and if they hadn't have done that, I don't think I would have had the idea. Not not to go there anyway. Yeah. So it just show, and I honestly believe that leaving and getting away from that actually saved my life. Yeah, yeah. Like just, there's no two ways about it. If I had stayed in that environment, it was, it was, it was. It's crazy to think, you know, death was not a good enough motivation to stop me from using drugs. Yeah, I mean, what then? What is like? That's. I'll get I'll get to there I'll get to that point because I was really searching for that answer because addiction is just not rational there's just no rationality to it I just after uh, my friend Matt took his life my best friend who's more a brother than anything you know um, he tried to take his own life within a week of that I yeah. actually restrained him in a headlock on the side of a tidal river to stop him from drowning himself, and that was big due. That was due to drug addiction, and it just it completely um, controlled his mind and everybody's. We was all in that state, but he was so to the point where he had absolutely no control of himself, and it was making him do things that you know, just as a personality, as he he personally wouldn't do. You know, as a as a normal, clear thinking person, it just shows showed how much of a mental illness an addiction actually is. Yeah, yeah. Just completely lose control. Yeah. In the same way as schizophrenia or something, you know, it's almost like being schizophrenic, because the action, the actions that you're performing are, whilst you have free will, these you're so conditioned that you actually don't really have any free will anymore over that whilst, whilst ultimately you can make that decision the reality of making that decision to not do it in a certain environment it's just close to impossible yeah, yeah. so that's why actually removing myself from that situation was the best thing that I could have done the best yeah since then I've encouraged so many friends to actually do the same as me and it's had very similar impact on them as it did on me. Obviously, you can go somewhere and jump straight back into the same shit. Yeah. Someone said to me the other day, though, a rolling stone gathers no moss. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But at the same time, learning to stay in one place and really commit to something is also uh, also something, you know, you've got the balance between those things. Mm. The thing that I tr- had trouble with was not the drugs, but the alcohol. Like, I was searching for happiness or masking my problems that I didn't realize it was mental health. I thought it was just problems that you had to be a man to just get up and 
iron them out, like sort them out yourself. So alcohol was a way to escape that. And in the long run, I was hoping that it would fix it somehow, magically. But um, that wasn't the case. So what what is your solution for um, these problems and... You know, Alcoholics Anomalous, they, uh, they're the most successful program to date that actually helps people to solve that problem. Um, there's a few steps that are really interesting in that program. The first one, everybody knows that. Admit that you have a problem. Yeah, yeah. Everybody knows that because if you don't admit it and you're in denial, that's enough. Well, nothing's going to change, yeah, is it? You can't help someone who won't help You themselves. don't even know you've got a problem, so how are you going to change it? Yeah. One of the steps I found really interesting is it's actually, um, I think it was like a, it's a Christian, uh, com- uh, something to do with Christianity that actually started this program. Um, one of the steps is actually believing, well, accepting that you yourself personally can't do anything about it. Everything that you've tried has failed. You don't have the power personally to do anything about this. To change. Because, be, to change it because you've tried everything. That you, every one of your ideas is shit. You've tried them and they haven't worked. Yeah. And you need to surrender. And that's an important word. Surrender and accept that you, on your own, cannot sort this problem out. Just fail. Everything you've tried failed. Everything I tried failed. Yeah. I've seen so many people who've just tried to do it on their own. And usually what happens if you quit one thing, you'll replace it with something else. And that's, oh, actually, yeah. that's actually the nature of life. Yeah. You, you have to replace something with something else. Now, it's what, what do you replace that with that's not going to kill you? Yeah, or that's hard. Or become addicted to and create negative impacts on your life? Yeah. Now, that's actually the, the essence of life, the, the, the entire mission. There's only really one game in town. In this entire world, there's only really one thing that everyone's really trying to figure out. I explained to you, I started to explain to you earlier, but we'll go through it again now. <laughs> the um, what what happened is that I I, I, I tr- I'll, I'll go I'll rewind a little bit. So I tried yeah. absolutely everything to try and to try and solve this problem. Um, when I knew, moved to New Zealand two years ago. I just thought, I just tried everything. I quit everything. So I wasn't eating meat. I, I quit eat. I went vegan and stopped eating dairy. I quit coffee. I what, didn't do any drugs. I quit alcohol. I changed everyone around me and I more or less focused on business and I started trying to, started to try and start a business. You would expect, I had, an, I had a nice house, I moved into a nice house as well. Everything, everything, materially I did in a way that you would expect would be conducive for happiness yeah 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 in the middle of all that I actually sat there with a pretty extreme amount of anxiety yeah that didn't make a lot of sense to me I was just quite frustrated I was like well if you can do everything that everybody tells you to do so you had everything I had everything that I that needed. needed. In, I had everything that I needed and more. Yeah. You know, I wasn't rich, but I was earning good money at the time. I had a good job. Like, I, I really, there wasn't much more that I could have had without extreme things. But it was just a good taste of the base level of everything you needed with excess. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I tried the drug thing. That didn't work. But I tried, yeah. this is the healthy <laughs> way. You know, I tried it all the healthy way. Or the uh, way that my parents would have told me or their parents would have told them, you know, have house, money, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I sat in the middle of that absolutely miserable. Shit, so everything you've seen on TV or you hear about or people say you need to do this, you need to do that, and you still, still weren't happy. Yeah, it was shit. And I was just like, so what's the answer to that? And I'd say I more or less begged whatever I, at the time, I would have mind, I would have had in my mind the universe, or I've always had faith, I've always been agnostic to a sense that I don't really know what's going on. Yeah. To say that you're atheist would say, I know what's happening, and there's nothing happening. Yeah. So incredibly yeah. misguided and arrogant statement, or, or delusional, or the fact that, or ignorant, 
statement to say I know what's going on and there's nothing going on out there that's beyond my own power. Anyway, I was always quite agnostic and I was sort of like was sort of like praying in a sense like please guide me to whatever it is that's going to remove remove me from this miserable situation. <laughs> Cause Give me some just, answers, cause man. Because it's just shit. Yeah. I can't, just don't want to go back to the drug addiction. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. And it's so just going to filter me back into that. Were you more happy on drugs than your situation that you're, you were in? On drugs, I was really happy and then really miserable. So it was a and roller coaster. I was really happy, like a roller coaster. Yeah. It's like super happy. Super miserable, super happy, and it's leading to the grave fast. It's gonna yeah, kill me fast. Yeah. It jobs, it jobs and seven then, feet down. And then doing all the, the sober, healthy stuff, I was just, you know, unmotivated. Like, it was like, why, what is the motivation driving me? What What is it that I'm actually chasing here? What's, right. the, what's <laughs> the end goal? Yeah. Like, wh- where is this all going? Because, you know, I, could, like, I was just trying to extract happiness from things and nothing was providing me what I wanted anyway um, shortly after that a friend of mine asked, to, asked me if I wanted to go to a yoga and meditation retreat um, and so th- this is where it all starts this mm. is where ah oh, okay okay so this is where what do you call it what would you call it yeah. the, the type of yoga and meditation so or, it's like the spiritual journey starts or Opening doors Fundament- of it. Fundamentally, everybody is spiritual. It's what they are. Everybody is a, is a soul. Right. So yeah. everybody is spiritual, whether they want to be or not. It's just it all comes down to their consciousness. Like being aware of it. Are they in material consciousness or are they in spiritual consciousness? Right. Okay. I'll explain that shortly. We'll get to that. Yeah, yeah. So. I went to um, this uh, retreat. You know, everybody knows. Someone says yoga meditation. Everybody knows that would be good for them, don't they? Yeah. You know, someone says, no one says, oh, that's not going to be good for you. So yeah, it's like, yeah. I was like, yeah, all right, I'll go. I'll go. And um, I turned up, and it wasn't what I expected. <laughs> I'd done a little bit, a tiny bit of yoga before, and I did all that stuff. Um, and that... You know, the, the physical yoga stuff wasn't really where the magic was. That's like, it, it does do things. It removes chi around your body and uh, actually helps, assists with... Uh, yo- yoga means uh, union, and it means to connect your consciousness. It's like the connection of consciousness with something above you. Oh, like a, gra- right. a, greater, a greater power than yourself. So it's to, to actually link up that connection, and that's how you feel connected feel good and feel love and things like and such things so it's actually the yoga is the process of purification to understand who you really are yeah 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 so i did the yoga stuff and the yoga was good but then they did this um um it's called kirtan meditation and i expected to be sat down you know doing all this stuff the silent meditation like buddha all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it was none of that. It was, um, so they're singing transcendental sounds. And they sing it with a band. And it's sort of like you, you're at a gig, really. You know, you're basically at a gig. There's a band <laughs> playing and then they're singing stuff. But there was like a little bit of me that was like, this feels a bit like being at church. You know, they're singing, oh, thing, they're yeah. singing things or like being at assembly at school in the morning and they're all singing. And yeah. I didn't never sing at school. I don't like my voice. I'm not a fan of my voice at all. But, yeah. You know, even talking on I, this podcast and then hearing it back, it's like, oh, your voice. Yeah, everyone, so. everyone um, <laughs> has that though. Sorry, sorry about my voice. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I sat there for a while and they're doing all this, the singing and stuff. And I sat there for the first day. I don't think I did did anything. And halfway through the second day, I started singing, but in a in a different voice, just because thinking, oh, if my mates at home could see me doing this. <laughs> which is a bit gay you know like oh, that was just what my the voice in my head was telling me and then you know I, I, I let go of that and I just started to sing these transcendental sounds and it just was just like poof, something like this shell that was holding me just 
shattered away. And I was like, oh, I can breathe. And I did it. And, you know, it's quite, it's really repetitive. They sing the same, the same sounds over and over again. Um, and there's, a, there's various different mantras that they do. Man yeah. Mantra means to be free of the mind. Free of the mind. Yeah. So you sing these and essentially what it does is the same as meditation, like uh, the silent meditation is they sit and they uh, remove the mind so that the, the constitution of how, the, how we are set up is we are a soul. People think that they have a soul. We don't have a soul, you are a soul. So the soul is the awareness, the thing that is looking out having the experience, feeling, feeling. It's the thing that's actually feeling the emotions, like science can't explain. It can explain how information goes in, but it can't actually explain how there's a gaze looking out. How it, oh yeah, how it brings in the information. It doesn't. Yeah. How, how, yeah, it's like who, who, who is looking out? It's like the input and the output on a computer. Yeah, yeah. So the output it just doesn't know Science that's can't explain enough. that. That's consciousness. That's that's you. Yeah. That's me. That's who we are. We're the soul. So on top of the soul gets piled the mind. People think the brain, the mind is in the head, in the brain. The mind is completely separate to the material. It's a material energy, but it's separate to the this gross body, this stuff, this flesh. Okay. Right. It's a subtle energy. So there's the subtle body which goes on top of the soul. So this all gets piled on top. You've got the mind, the intelligence, and the false ego. Okay, so what this does is the mind and the false ego. The mind is a tool that's there to be used. Okay, so when, we, when the false ego gets put on top of all of this, it allows us to believe that we are not the soul, but we are the gross. We are the gross body, and then the gross body gets put on top of all this stuff. All right. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. what happens is the false identification of who we are, the false ego, allows us to believe I am the body. And that's it. And it doesn't. It, unaware of our spiritual identity, unaware that we are a spirit, spirit soul. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. when we believe that we are the body, we try to. En enjoy ourselves and be happy feeding ourselves through our senses so you'll smell something you'll be like that smells good yeah. and then you're, you're off and you're off to get a sandwich and you eat this sandwich but you inside you're empty and you eat this sandwich and the first bite's amazing it'll be the best sandwich you've ever eaten yeah so you're yeah. like you're like oh I'm, I'm empty inside so you just keep eating sandwiches or with me, it's biscuits and cookies. I'm terrible. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting fat at the minute. Yeah. Just from all these cookies I eat. And, you know, you eat one, and it's delicious. Then by the time you finish the pack, which I do in one, because I'm terrible, it's like yeah. a, it's something that I should, I need to probably never do because it's addictive for me, eating sugar. <laughs> and by the time you finish the pack of cookies, you feel sick. You've got a headache. You're dizzy. You can't, your eyes are all fuzzy. You're like, oh, my God, why have you done that? Someone gives you another packet of cookies, you're like, get it away, no more, get them <laughs> cookies away from me. Send it back to the store. Um, and that's the nature of material, material things, is you have a little bit, and it seems great, but the more you have, the worse it gets. Yeah. Oh. It can be the same with anything, it can be a song you listen to, a material yeah. sound, it starts great, everything material starts good, and ends bad. it just gets worse and worse as you go on. Right. And the thing is, you are feeding these things to the body. No matter how much of it you have, you're never satisfied and you will always be empty inside, trying to satisfy yourself with these things. The other nature of, the, of doing this is that everything is only about you. Very selfish. It's only selfish because it's just you satisfying yourself or attempting to satisfy yourself through the senses right but not using what's the soul so the soul the soul has a desire and that's to love 
And is is that it? Just love. That's all the soul wants: love and be loved. Oh, that's right. all we want. So love, love is giving. Love is the opposite of selfish. Yeah, yeah. So it's like the real ego, the spiritual ego, wants to love, but because it thinks that it's the body, it falsely identifies with these desires that we have, the 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 senses. They and then the senses give power to the mind, and the mind can either be the one's greatest friend or one's greatest enemy. There's no enemy greater than the mind. Yeah. And, you know, that's inside your own head. You take that everywhere with you. Yeah, that's interesting. That's, um, that's definitely... A lot of people do chase... They chase bigger things. That, and you see it everywhere. But the one thing you don't see... Everybody watch, te- or not everybody, but most people watch television. And you don't see love on television. You see people break up. You see people cheat on people. You see people with flash cars, models, money, all this stuff. But even in songs, like, songs these days, they don't talk about love. There's no... Even when people are talking about love, there's a good chance they don't know what love is. Yeah. Most, <laughs> most most people talking about love I mean most people in, in in relationships are simply trying to they're in material consciousness trying to extract happiness out of the other person right in the same way that you're trying to extract happiness out of eating these biscuits or listening to something or whatever it is that you're doing most of the time As you're thinking yourself. about yourself having sex is a big big one you are literally just trying to pleasure yourself to yeah. feel better. Same as you, me using drugs. My drug addiction is all about me. Yeah. If anything get would, would get in the way of me getting my uh, chance, at, my, my attempt at happiness through using this chem- chemical, there'd be a problem. So where do you draw the line? Like, where do you know when it's not all about yourself? Because even helping other people that could be for your own self-pleasure as well, you know? There's the word is service. That is the word that represents love. Service. Service. There's some people say, oh, I'm, I want to help such and such. Or, oh, I want to, or this person's mentally ill, I want to fix them. Mm. Help and if you, if you help someone... If you want to help someone, you see them as weak. If you want to fix someone, you see them as broken. But when you want to serve someone, you see them as whole. You see them as complete. Ah. Oh. Okay. And Sir. often, people don't always mean what they say. And people use language incorrectly all the time. And you sort of have to gauge and read what people mean by what they're saying. Because what they say isn't always what they mean. Yeah. But um, people, when someone says they want to help someone, they possibly mean that they want to serve them. I don't know. But with service, when you serve someone, and that's love, you don't want anything back from that. You have no expectation back from that. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. With help and fix, often that comes from a place of false identification. And they just want the pleasure of. Well, yeah, they want to be. They want to get their own uh, se- um, security through I'm I uh, val- or validation. I'm I'm someone that helps people, and then they feel good about themselves for being someone that's a helpful person. Yeah. Or they do something, and actually they they come and help you clear out your garage, but actually they want you to build a shed for them or something, you know. They want something in return. And this is this is stressful. This is stressful to learn because I I started realizing all this stuff, and then I analyzed my own behavior, and I realized that I was a selfish prick. <laughs> and yeah. actually, most people don't want to embark on this spiritual journey because they know how much of a prick they are. Yeah, they already know enough of how much of a prick they are without even looking into it. Don't be a selfish prick. <laughs> Every, well, unfortunately. 99% of people are. Yeah. Um, and until you... And it's not there. 
I'll say it's not their fault. It is everybody's fault. Everybody's responsible for everything that's happening in their own existence. But they don't have the knowledge. But in this state, they're so materially conditioned and entangled in this thing that they've created that they no longer have any awareness for that. Yeah. They're ignorant. They're in the mode of ignorance. They have no awareness anymore to what's going on. No. So, you know, it. when I learned all this stuff... When, when I, I mean, so part of my anxiety that I was talking about earlier on in that particular period of my life has been a few. <laughs> but in that particular period, my, I was focused on what I wanted to. I was trying to start an online business so that I could um, travel the world and work from a laptop and go and experience things, go and snowboard and do all these things that I wanted to do that I thought would make me happy. Yeah, and there sounds, might be a really nice, there might well. be a nice little time. Yeah, you know, it would be a nice. Little but if I'm so, but if I'm self-centered, in the middle of that, I'm gonna suffer mentally. I'm gonna have mental health problems, and I did. Yeah. Because I was focused. So what happened is I was doing building work, and then I had this idea. The second I had this idea, oh, I want to go and do this. I then my my reality, my my job, living in this place. Um, doing this work, it was like, I don't want to be doing this anymore. And now this projection that I'd made to, of this other vision that I'd had was what I wanted. So because I didn't have that now, and I knew that there was a lot of work, I was just so miserable. Shit. My current existence became miserable. There was another, another example of this. So I had, I had, this, I had this, uh, this life that I'd set up that was reasonably very comfortable. Uh, and then I met a girl and we actually ended up together and despite having all this stuff set up as well as I could at the time it was just it was just magic how it, it all unfolded and put me in this position which was wonderful and then because I had a then had a long distance relationship this entire thing that I had became miserable because I was so attached to this new idea that despite oh, yeah. having everything so just what you want controls whether you're happy or completely miserable, regardless of how good, which it is a is. relative term, dependent on you, dependent on that. So it just goes to show that what you want is completely controlling your happiness. Happiness, yeah. And that's dependent on selfish uh, motivations so what so what's the answer so what what I had to do what I had to do was um, battle go to war with this selfishness and spend a very long time getting my head around accepting uh, that I had to completely change every single thing that I believed and thought and did. Jeez. And that's like, that, this is what they, they talk about in ego death. It's like letting go, like everything that I believed to be true was sh bullshit. So you just race it. All of my everything. ideas, all of my ideas were shit. <laughs> you know, everything. Everything that I thought was true was bollocks. Crazy. And that is stressful. And actually, that in itself made me very mentally not, you know, I, like it wasn't nice. Yeah. Because then what you, you think you've stood on solid ground. And the way I described it is it felt like I stood on solid ground and it turned out that actually I was in the Antarctic and the, the ice started to crack and they all skip moved apart and I was like floating on this one little cube of ice. In the yeah. middle of the sea, like hanging in there. What's going on? I've got nothing to stand on. There's no yeah. solid ground, and you know, anxiety was through the roof. Um, so this is the process <laughs> of the whole change. Yeah, this is the, the process of the change. And so could you I can, say? I can tell you, it's not easy. The and change not, into spiritual allergy, kind of. Yeah, the 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 dis the everything's contaminated by a bit of both, but the distance between the material and the spiritual, it's it's difficult because you're, we are so attached to all this stuff. But comfortable, yeah. Well, we think we're comfortable. But it's, 
<coughs> just being so attached to it, like not not being able to let things go. And this is a big cause of suffering in this world, is not being like the more we hold on to something, the material the material energy is always changing. It's constantly, constantly changing. People, our bodies, our situation, our homes, the weather, all of it. If mm. you if you try to take shelter in anything in this world, you're going to be hurt over and over again. If you try to take shelter in a relationship, in a drug, none of these things are constant. None of these things are absolute. They're all just constantly changing. The material yeah, yeah. world is described as illusion. It's not real. Yeah, I've heard it always that. it always changes. So many so times. So it's as well. like, where do I take shelter? Where do I actually go? to be stable and secure and feel okay. I mean, feeling okay again, it's a selfish desire, but we'll get to that because, but anyway. So, I, I learned that the spiritual world, that which we are anyway, our soul, yeah. and this spiritual world, that is all permanent, absolute. It's true. Yeah. There's a, there's a word, in, in Sanskrit, there's a, the word religion. The word religion in English, it pretty much means like a faith, a doctrine, something you can join, a set of beliefs. And it's, it's actually changeable. So the word religion in English is actually a material sound. But they have, they have, a, they have another word for that in Sanskrit. The word religion in Sanskrit means that which is absolute and does not change. So, in that sense, religion is referring to truth. Truth is that which is permanent. It's not relative. It's not like good and bad or our opinion. It's that which never, ever changes. So, everybody, in that sense, is religious. Just by what they are. Just by being, who they are. Being who you are. But you need to understand that. And through... through get, uh, and through certain practices such as singing these transcendental sounds you can actually access something that's permanent and stable you can actually take shelter in something that never changes and it's always there there's actually always a place where you can go to be safe right so that's um that's that song you're singing before is it mm. and is it just the one song is tell me about that song how does it how does it work and how, why is it the those words like those words are actually when when a word is transcendental it is no different to what it is in the spiritual world when you say coca-cola it's just like a hollow word if you said that a hundred times you go mad yeah but when you use these transcendental mantras they are actually exactly what they are in the spiritual world. And when you use these sound vibrations, they actually connect you to that spiritual dimension. How does that work? How does a, a volume or a voice connect you to being spiritual? Because, because that word is spiritually potent and that sound vibration is spiritually potent. Right. It's something that you have to actually do and experience. Same with any spiritual practice. It's not. Uh, um, it's not my job or anyone's job to try to convince someone of something. Yeah. It's down to. I. I, I mean, all this information has been passed on to me by people who are infinitely wiser than me and more intelligent. Yeah, you know, I'm really fortunate to have been able to associate with some amazing personalities, and I try to pass this information on as it is, as they've told me, without changing it. Yeah, and that's the sort of the process that it keeps getting passed on as it is, without being changed. Which I believe in Christianity and the church, they you know that's been pissed about with and changed. Um, Even the Bibles, like changes, you know. Like everything changed. It, sh it, it should never change. None of this information. 
Yeah. Should always be the same. Um, it can be experienced. Everything's experienced. You know, even our even our experiences in the material world here that we're having and the pain that we're experiencing and how much we're suffering is attempting to teach us the same thing. It's trying to bring us back home, essentially. Yeah. It's trying to bring us home. It's, it doesn't, like... And we're creating this thing and through these desires and our beliefs, and they're just causing us to suffer over and over again. What I don't understand is how we can suffer over and over again and repeat the same pattern over and over again and not think, this isn't working. Nothing here works. I Through, through so many of my friends taking their life, it really caused me to think, where's the happiness? What's what's going on and why and I really started to observe everybody's lives and just A, a to check how they were <laughs> see yeah. how, like, how are you are you okay would you like me to be would you, do you need a friend you know so I can be there offering that service yeah that's something that I started to offer through break the chain and just just generally as a you know as a person as a person out as me that's what, what I want to do now that's my entire existence on this planet is to serve other people through this way. That's the way I've found to serve. Yeah. And even the people that are in the best situation, and especially, especially the people that seem like they've got the most, are often the most messed up. Yeah. You know, it's just this world, it's just uh, based on a lot of uh, false ideas and bullshit, especially social media, you know. Now that everybody's got a brand, everybody's projecting themselves in this way, holding themselves to an expectation attached to an idea of themselves that they can't possibly uphold. It's like someone, someone's benefiting from, someone's gaining from all of this, you know? That's why I feel like there's no change of happiness because when we're stuck in... I, the idea of we need all this stuff like clothes, cars, all this holidays, all this stuff. I feel like on the other end, someone's making all that money and they're not telling us. They're always going to do what they're going to do. Greed, greed, anger and lust. Lust means desire, not sexual. It includes that, but lust in in this terminology simply means desire and what we want. So, yeah. Like all this, um, these things are literally take us away from who we really are. And everybody has these tendencies. That's part of the material condition and a part of our free will. And everybody has those tendencies. So we, that's never gonna change. And there's always gonna be people exploiting someone and this place this world is not designed to be a perfect place. No. It's never going to be that. You get all these people, all these people practicing this spiritual stuff, all this fluffy stuff, like, oh, it's perfect, look at the sunrise, and the sunrise is beautiful, don't get me wrong. Yeah, it is but pretty But the fact beautiful. that they, they, they're going on like, that this place is absolutely perfect, it's not. Yeah. It's never going to be perfect. The spiritual world is perfect. Mm. If you, if you want to find, it, the, <laughs> if you want, if you want to find what you're looking for, it's not here, but you can get a taste of that here, and you can, by purifying yourself and removing this material conditioning, you can get a taste of that and live that in this world. You can taste that and experience that here, but right. if you, but ultimately, this isn't the place where we experience that. So we're in the wrong place, and it's our job to figure out how to get out. So what, so would you class yourself as a hippie? A hippie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh God, I hate hippies. Okay. I don't know, there's, there's, what, what's a hippie? Well, <laughs> what, what question? <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Well, cause there's a, I feel like in, on television you, you, you think of people that are spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> just like tree huggers or hippies that they 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 put a, a a brand on you like a label well hugging a tree that a tree's a material thing 
hippies. Um, you know, it could be hippies. Hippies, hippies are generally seem to be quite politically motivated. Um, politics is a nasty game, full of sharks. Um, mm. You know, very a few spiritual people, genuine spiritual people, because there's a lot of people. This is what I'm saying. There's a lot of people who claim that they're spiritual people. Okay, and so with, all the, with all the fluffy stuff, but they're super obsessed with sex and they might be having orgies and all these strange right. things and they're, they're hugging trees, but they're actually, this is, they're so a- actually focused on material stuff. There's only one thing that's spiritual and that's the, the soul and the super soul. That's it. The, everything else is material. And unless you're in that consciousness, it's not transcendental. If you don't know about that, so people who are going out doing holding hands, skipping down the street, and whatever all, all they're doing, sunset. unless mm. watching a sunset, S- just watching a sunset, flowers. it's not a spiritual thing. It's in the mode of goodness. It's a very high platform of material consciousness where it's easy to practice mater- uh, spiritual life from. When you're drinking alcohol and doing drugs, that's a very difficult place to sp- practice spiritual life from. Using drugs yeah. is not a spiritual thing. See, I kind of. Oh, it was weird because when I when I started doing psychedelic, I felt like I was spiritual in a way of like I kind of I, I I saw more of the world than what I did when I was sober. Yeah, and you did, and it was it was too much, and it was and it and it also um, tricked my mind into scenarios that weren't true. So, it was uh, it was like a, I don't know what was real and what was not real. Looking back at it now, but I you definitely feel connect. I felt like I was connected to everybody and everything when I was on drugs. Mm. What they do is they show you that there's more there than you know about. Yeah, unlocks um, uh, like another vision. Yeah, and it shows you. Um, it shows you just some more, some more information on this world that you don't get from the TV, you don't get from um, the newspaper talking about it on a normal conversation. It's just, it's crazy. It's, um, it's definitely something. A lot of people in, you know, that I've been associating with who are, you know, later on in their life now, have actually actually came to this path through uh, using drugs when they were younger, through using hallucinogenics and having these having these profound experiences. But what they realised is that they were only going to take them so far, and they'd shown them something, and there was nothing the left, and thing. there was nothing left in that experience for them anymore. And to get any further, they had to stop doing that and let's take it seriously. Take take it the sober way there's a lot of things that you've got to that you've got to stop doing and if you actually want to make any progress see when I was in the psych ward we didn't have mobile phones so we and I didn't watch any TV because I was like more worried about it was, it was just damaging my mental health but a lot of people talk about spiritual stuff in psych wards and it's crazy because a we don't have our phones um, B, half of us aren't watching TV where we got all this time to just think about stuff so it, it's like it automatically puts you like drifts you back into a spiritual state where you just start talking about spiritual stuff we start talking about like we didn't even mean to we're just like talking normally and then we're just spiritual would just come up in the conversation and then we'd go for like hours just talking about it yeah, there's not having any distractions. Yeah. And being in the mode of goodness, not being on drugs and such, uh, really encourages you to, to wake up. It's yeah. Because it unpiles, there's a lot of stuff being, un- like I say, the soul's got all this stuff piled on top of it. The drugs and the distraction of the mobile phones and the sex and the partner and all this stuff, it's all on top. And you start pulling these stuff off your oh, way. Yeah. You know, you can actually see out. See the truth and also when you're not distracted with all this stuff 
and you're in the mode of goodness, when you hear something, you can actually hear the truth and understand the truth better. Yeah. So what? So what does it mean to wake up? Like, is that that's like a form of realizing the truth, like who we are, that's like yeah, the that's soul. Exa- that's exactly what it is. Waking up. When people say waking up, becoming becoming con- spiritually conscious. It just means more, uh, under, better understanding of the truth. And the one thing that um, got my paranoia skyrocketed when I was, um, when I had bad mental health, was that I thought waking up that the government hates it, the government will chase you or try to get you if you wake up. What do you think about that? Mm, I think I'd have a lot of chasing to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. What are you chasing? Well, uh, here's 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 the thing. It's like when you look at uh, accounts of people who have actually um, been self-realized and popular personalities. Take Jesus Christ as an example. Yeah. There me- there's been many, but take him as an example. What did they do to him? Yeah. And. There are many sacrifices that have to be made for telling the truth. The truth com- telling the truth comes at a cost. Yeah. But it's do you choose the material world or the truth? The blue pill or are the red pill? Pre- are you prepared to tell the truth and and suffer the consequences? Because at the, at the, choosing spiritual life, you're basically saying that well, I don't choose this world anymore. I don't want to serve myself. I don't want to be an illusion anymore. Yeah, and you'll uh, and you have a duty to do. Everybody on this planet having this experience has a duty. Everybody has a dharma. Dharma's like blueprint. Think is what what you should do. Yeah, yeah, Everybody yeah. Everybody has that, and you can choose whether or not you want to do that. So, what is the cost of changing to spiritual? You can't be a selfish prick anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you can't, you, you can't, um, you know, you seeing things as they are, you realise that everybody's so contaminated with selfishness. So... That's it, a big one. It, so you kind of, like, you can't really fit in with people that don't really know what's going on? Like, um, you can, or you just, it's well, just hard? You, you see... I, I, I've, I'm not that far down this journey. This is a big path, a big journey. Like, I'm not that advanced. Yeah. You know, you meet some people who have control of their senses, and th- these people are really unusual to find, to come across. Self-realized people, we call it a, a swami, someone who can control the senses. And if you control the senses, you control your own mind. You don't come across these people very often. Yeah. One, one, of, the, one of the things that you have to sacrifice is certain types of association. Um, you know, um, what you have to be very careful what information you're putting in to yourself. You, like watching stupid shit, mm. listening to stupid things, hanging around with people talking absolute Just, shit. Um, yeah. You know, you have to, you have to uh, change what's around you so that actually, because it's so easy, if you go back into certain association how quickly this material just piles straight back on you again you can you can you can have made all this progress and, and, then, and then you get and then like i've spent the past few months constantly in spiritual association practicing reading every day chanting doing my meditation every day like every day Jeez. and i've just left yesterday and already i'm anxious about it you know <laughs> just going back into the material world on my own Without yeah. any association to keep me on the right track because when everybody's together, it's you know it's really powerful experience doing all that stuff together. And it's not yeah, like yeah. it's not like everyone's really doing it together, but it's just like holding that sort of it like keeps everything quite safe. Oh, yeah, you know, okay. You know, this is why people set up temples and ashrams and they go and they just do this practice within that. Right. Until until they get strong enough to go out there and and their belief and practice and routine to be so strong that it doesn't get affected so much by external things 
It's like whoever's whoever's belief system is stronger wins. Yeah. So I can <laughs> I can be doing this thing now, which I am so confident and and believe is absolutely good. Yeah. To me, experientially, it's right because I'm experiencing it to be right. I'm experiencing it to be making changes. I'm experiencing no longer having the des- the desire to use drugs. Here and now, I don't want to use drugs. Yeah. And this is this is environmental. And before, I, I, I've been away for six years. And in that time, most most days I've thought about doing using drugs. Jeez. I left and I just had it clawing out the inside of my mind, scratching me to pee, like just, just like it was so painful. And being like, you know, all I wanted to do it was like my number one focus. And through doing this, I now here and now don't want to do drugs anymore. I would much rather do this. Yeah. When I go back to England and I'm with all my friends, I'm going to really want to do drugs. And if you put it in front of me, I'm having a hard time. Yeah. Because I'm going to want to do it. Yeah. So it comes down to um, being wise and sensible and with that association. Yeah, you got to realise why you're doing it and what you're doing it for. Um. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of that's a lot of a lot of knowledge. Um, of where I see, it, I see it as I see that there's like two different worlds. Um, whether which one I fit in, I don't really know. Do I care that much about it? I I don't really know. I do like the idea of happiness finding it in yourself instead of finding it i know that happiness isn't in cars like i know like the basic stuff but i just i whether i'm ready to try um go and change i guess change i'm kind of i was always i was always kind of on the fence and for a long time and I just feel like after this mental health stuff I do want to try like get into more knowledge so gaining more knowledge about the brain and um, the soul and everything like that kind of makes me lean into that way a little bit but learning about the brain is a bit of a minefield yeah I don't know if I bother you can learn some stuff makes you sound real clever when you talk about it but Essentially, uh, learning how to um, get past the mind, learning about the soul and the these soul. things. You can remove all of this complicated stuff. You can actually sort of bypass it. Oh, yeah. You know, you can you can go... They, science understands almost nothing about the mind. It's got all... It just has no idea. It understands some stuff about the function of the brain. They're different things. And patterns and it stuff. It understands things about... It, it, can, un, it, it can observe things, observe, observational, behavioural uh, patterns. It can see, okay, you do this and this generally happens and it's quite general, but... It, and it's called this... But, they don't, but these people who are studying this don't know that they're not the body. In, in, in the Vedas, which means... Vedas means knowledge, and this information has been around for since time immemorial, since before they can even remember... It's been written down for thousands and thousands of years. There's such a comprehensive and complete picture, an absolutely unbelievable amount of information that science is barely scratching the surface of. Where is this information? A lot of it's been translated from Sanskrit into English. We've got the Bhagavad Gita, the Srimad Bhagavatam. Oh, there's yeah. so, and I'm talking like the Srimad Bhagavatam is a volume of books like this big. Jeez. Like it's for people who can't see that it's they don't have that on audio know, book. three feet long <laughs> books and no they don't, they, a small amount of it's on an audio book oh yeah um it's just it's just blown my mind how like reli- religion in the english sense never interested me in the absolute slightest it was so unappealing yeah but this when i when i've started doing this i've heard things and i've been like that is true 
you know, all this philosophy about the karma yoga and all this stuff, like the um, constitution of the soul and the body and all these things, they tell me that, and like, you're just like, that's true. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and and you can practice it practically. It's very practical. You can do it and it makes a difference. Yeah. You know, I've actually witnessed it. And not to say that some of these people who that don't no that I've been told that any pra any process that delivers you to the to the goal is it's fine. You know, anything that that does what you want it to do and can get and can deliver you there, it's okay. But this yoga process, the sadhana bhakti, what I do, it's the process of surrendering and rendering service. Through doing that, it just, it, it works. Yeah. And this, I will get to this point because this is, so this is how I beat my own anxiety. And this is what I've done and how I've shaped my life to support me uh, and keep me on the right track and make sure that you know, I've got enough meaning and purpose to get me through the bad times um, so without without me slipping into chaos again. Is I I very fortunately have been assigned a purpose <laughs> by the fact that so many of my friends have died, took yeah. their own life, or drug overdose, or whatever, and I've been blessed with giving the um, the skills to help these people I never knew I had any of these skills I didn't know I knew anything about this and then all of a sudden one day sort of something clicked and I was like oh I just sort of know how to help these people yeah and uh, before that I was just lost didn't know what I was good at just thought I uh, didn't know what I liked doing especially I had no passion for anything and then all of a sudden click and then I had this internal inspiration it wasn't like I was forcing it it was like I'm called to do this and so I built break the chain which started off as a blog, and I started sharing this information with people, uh, to, and, and I was so nervous to do this. I was just like, I, you know, I was sharing things about my a drug addiction on Facebook with people, yeah. and, like my parents, it's friends, hard. and stuff like that, and I was like, oh, I don't really want to do this. I thought I'd just get judged so badly. I was yeah. really caring, caring about what other people were thinking, and I just went for it, and the response was just un. It was so I just couldn't even explain how how overwhelmed I was with the response. You know, everybody's received this well that I've spoke to. So many people who've been considered and taken their own lives have sent me a message, and I've been able to talk to them, and they're all still here, which is wonderful. Yeah. Someone messaged me not long ago saying they'd quit heroin because of what I've written, and yeah, it's cool, man. I didn't think that my writing had that power. I didn't. I just, I just it's didn't. Just, yeah, it's just experience. That's all. You just need to talk. Like that's the main thing. Is just to talk about it, and that brings other people to um to the idea of like I'm not the only one going through this. What's nice about these doing these things, this service, because I don't want anything back from this. Yeah. But it's delivering me what me trying to ex to extract happiness out of other things couldn't deliver through yeah. through doing these things this these this uh, service I've felt joy and happiness and I felt like I have a purpose yeah yeah and it's not it was totally not the not the cause for doing this but I was prepared and I'm prepared to give up my own happiness to do this because this is more important than me being happy yeah. Not to say that I won't be happy, but if I have to give, if I have to sacrifice that, because happiness comes and goes, all of these things pass by. Or emotions, you, it's no, it's not going to be a smooth ride. You can, you get addicted to happiness. Yeah. You expect to be happiness. You can want happiness so badly that when you're not happy, you're miserable. Being miserable becomes way more miserable. Yeah. Let happiness go. Forget about it. It's not important. What's important that your life is so meaningful and so purposeful that even when life is completely shit, you're going to get up in the morning and you're going to do what you got to do. Yeah, that's what I was lost when I came out of the psych ward. And I was like, well, I guess I got to focus on happiness and my mental health. 
and then I just, I had, I was in a situation where I just had to explain myself, so I did, and I got so much good feedback, and it was, it was a purpose, I was like, well, I could do this, and I would actually have a purpose, and then it's like, happiness, or a purpose, which is going to be an ugly truth of a purpose, or do I just be happy, and do the life that I had before I got sick. Which so, wasn't a happy life, was it? No, nah, it was it was a it was it wasn't a happy life. Not really. So but I thought it was I thought it was the way to go, but now I'm taking this life, the per, like the purpose life and doing all this mental health stuff and it's yeah, like you said, it it's a purpose in your life. It's um it's a reason to get out of bed. Yeah, it's a it's reason a, to exist. It's a, a reason, good reason. It's a reason not to kill yourself. It's a reason not to do drugs. Yeah, it's, it, to service, drink, to do drugs. Service is the reason. Yeah, and it's a, and I've I've never felt anything like that in my whole life, and it's like I was I had like I just had a new reason to live for, to live like a new reason to do stuff. But before I, I had I was just I was just chasing happiness, but now I've got a purpose. And it's like we, we was talking earlier about oxytocin. That's the, mm. the the chemical released in the body when you do an act of kindness, an act of generosity, an act of service. The chemical released is oxytocin. It's the same chemical released when you have a hug. When you shake someone's hand. Oh right. You know? Yeah, yeah. So this is this this chemical when you have oxytocin in your body it's harder to get addicted to things it boosts your Im immune system it makes you more creative all the good stuff right <laughs> so when, uh, the best thing about that is is it's contagious as well so when you do something nice you get a boost of oxytocin i experienced that at the same time i get a hit of that yeah. I'm more likely to go on and tell someone that you did something nice. They'll get a hit. They're more likely to go on and do something nice. It's like a ch it's like a domino effect. Right. It just spreads. It's contagious. True. That's interesting. That's that's crazy. So, you know what religion says about service, what chemistry says about service, but it's all it's all the same. It's there's no difference between science and religion and uh, um, all these things being of service is the answer yeah <laughs> give love don't don't take <laughs> and that's happiness it's not about us yeah this doesn't mean don't look after yourself when i say yourself don't look after your body that's your duty that has to be done anything that has to be done you have to do it yeah. And then beyond that, serve. True. And that does mean letting go of all this selfish bullshit that we think and justify and make any excuse for being the right way. It does have to it's slowly. Not this this does this does not happen overnight. This is a slow and gradual process that requires steady determination. A big journey. A little bit, constantly. If you make too big a jump, too fast, if people try and go from being manically depressed to super happy, there's a word for that, bipolar. You know, oh, you're yeah. making these big, these big switches from one side to another. Yeah. It's too big a leap. It's a steady, 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 steady process of moving towards what you, where you need to go. True. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. That's a lot of knowledge as well. But that's... Um, I just want to say thank you because through yeah. you doing... Um, you, you have such a talent for just putting it out there. You know, I personally have so much, uh, f I guess, fe it is fear of judgment. Yeah. Or, like it must be. Maybe it's a bit of laziness as well. I don't know. Yeah. But when... I, I overthink it and I'm like, oh, should I put this out? Is it going to be good enough? Um, yeah. All these things and I've just got this thing where I want to make it perfect in my own head. Yeah, yeah. 
and you, you, you just send it. You just chuck it out there. And it's amazing. <laughs> and it's really encouraged me to, um, to do uh, not the same because I still aren't, don't have that yet, but it's uh, I'm moving you, I don't towards know. that with steady determination. Yeah, yeah. Ste- real steady. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me to do this today. I really appreciate it. Nah, it's, been... it's good. Thank you for um, coming and the knowledge and um, just being here.